So my name is Amy Janess. I'm programming coordinator at the Athenaeum. And I want to welcome you for uh, our talk tonight with Kelly Omand and uh, say thanks for coming. Um, Kelly is in her 13th season as a botanist and ecologist for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And tonight she's going to talk about uh, many of the flowers that you can find on conservation property. Um, so I think without further ado, let's welcome Kelly in and start. Hi everybody. Um, this is my first Zoom presentation. So trying this out now. Uh, here we go. So this is a presentation that I prepared a few years ago to do for a group. And it was meant to be sort of a gentle introduction to the flora of Nantucket, as if you were able to zoom around the island and get a chance to see different properties, different NCF properties, and also just get a sampling of different ways and what's Nantucket special. When I developed it, I never expected that by zooming around the island metaphorically, we'd also be zooming on our computers. But everything is different today, and here we are. So as Amy said, I've been working for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. This is my 13th year and I'm a plant nerd. So I've been studying plants pretty much all my life since I was a little kid. And I'd like to just share my enthusiasm and my knowledge of plants around the island and especially our really rare plant communities and our special properties. So like I said, everything is really different now and um, we're out sniffing the flowers, same as, as usual. We're out doing our research but um, you know, masked and, and having a little bit of added difficulty and challenge. Um, this is a really cool uh, blunt leaf milkweed that I found um, a few weeks ago actually in full bloom. And you just have to stop and check things out. So what makes Nantucket botanically special? We've got a variety of factors. Um, really key is the isolation because we're an island. It's harder for plants to get here and harder for plants to just um, become established. It wasn't always an island, but we've been isolated since uh, the sea level rise after the last glaciation. And then um, people are bringing plants constantly, but because we're an island, less things get here. So we have less of a problem with invasives. We have a coastal climate. It's really a nice uh, mild maritime climate. In the winter, it's milder than on the mainland. And in the summer, it's actually a lot less hot. You may have noticed it gets up to the 100 degree mark pretty frequently right now off island, but we're, you know, 85, 88 or so. So it really moderates. There's also a lot of fog and a high humidity, but we also have dry sandy soils. So a lot of the plants that live here can really only tolerate those conditions and really thrive then. So we also have an interesting geological history. I mentioned the glacial retreat. So um, this island is the deposits of a glacier. And um, without that glacier, this island would not be the way it is. Finally, um, we also have an issue where we're at the edge of ranges for several species. And because we're at the northern end, of, end of, of species ranges from the south, and we're at the southern end of ranges of species from the north, we have pretty high diversity. We also have an interesting history of human, uh, human use. We, we know that the island was inhabited by Native Americans after the glaciation, and that um, when the colonists arrived, they dramatically changed things. But every human that's been here has made an impact on the island over time. So you can get a good view. Um, remember that Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard were part of the mainland before. Um, when, when the glaciers retreated, the wa waters melted and everything became an island. Um, before the Nantucket, and we would have the same vegetation as what was on the Cape. With isolation, we have a time capsule. I seem to be having an unstable action, which is new for me, so if I go out, please somebody warn me. So what's the result of all these factors? Well, we have several really unusual and rare plant communities of the Northeast. Uh, there are lots of early successional communities here that you just don't find anywhere else. And like I said, because of our range edges, we have a lot of New England. 
So we are diversity, despite a, a small area of land and a relatively boring geographic system. We don't really have anything that's, we barely have hills. We don't have mountains, we don't have lakes, and we don't have rivers. Uh, so you would think we would have a lot less species than we do, but we actually have relatively high diversity. So we have a lot of rare plants, um, 47 species out of, out of a list of 169, I believe. So the total known vascular flora in 1996, which is when the last uh, flora of Nantucket was written, uh, was over 1,200 species, 1,271. Um, since then, there's been a lot of change, a lot more gardening, people bringing plants over, and also weeds. So we really wanted to find out more about what was going on with the Nantucket flora and actually update things. So uh, Sarah Boyce from Linda Loring, Brian Connolly from Framingham State University, and I um, decided to develop this uh, botany project to review the flora of Nantucket. Um, Andrew McKenna Foster, formerly of Mariah Mitchell, was uh, the database manager. He's been really helping on the database work. So we decided to really update all the names to the present accepted scientific names. Things have been changing a lot with all the DNA research that's going on and people have different opinions now than they did in the past, whether a thing is a particular species or three species or subspecies of varieties. So doing all that work. Since then, we've also been looking a lot for new species that may have been here all along and been undiscovered or species that have been introduced and become established. So um, over the last several years, we've been spending a lot of time with boots on the ground looking. And I believe at this point, we're over 60 species that are to be added to the flora, which is pretty significant. A lot of them are non-native species, but there have been a few native species that have probably been here all along or probably were introduced um, by wildlife. So they'd be considered native because not introduced through human agency. So we're continuing to work on that project and hopefully wrap it up. And I'm hoping that maybe Sarah Boyce and I at some point can do some presentation on that, um, maybe with the Athenaeum. So um, back to the zooming, pretend you've got your broomstick or I don't know, whatever you like to zoom around on, maybe a magic carpet or whatever. Um, the cool thing about this is it's virtual so we can go wherever the heck we want and we can do it in whatever order we want. So I chose, hey, let's go west, um, Eel Point. Eel Point's sort of a peninsula that's shaped by all kinds of uh, wave action off to the western shore of the island, sort of looking out towards Tuckernuck. So if you've been there, uh, you'll know that it's a really interesting complex, beach, dunes, salt marsh, cranberry dune swales. There's a little bit of everything that you can find in a, in a coastal dune system out there. So the cranberry dune swales are particularly unusual and they're really rare on Nantucket. The dune swales um, form in sort of a depression area between dunes. So the water will run off and then there's also some recharge from hydrology below. So um, the cranberry, um, which you can see lower right there on, on the slide, is a native species and it's dominant these cranberry dune swales. Also a lot of shrubs, and some of those are native like the winterberry holly, highbush blueberry, and so on. And unfortunately at the we also have a species called rusty and that was introduced from and it actually probably um, started about 20 to um, 30 years ago in the dune swales and it's really been invading. So we've been doing a lot of management work to try to cut back and treat the wolves so that the cranberry swale can survive. And one of the interesting about the cranberry dune swales is that they are really little habitat in the middle of this um, sand open field of dunes. And they can really provide some habitat for um, birds that are moving around like ducks. And also uh, they are one of the habitats known for the spadefoot toad. And we used to have spadefoot toads in abundance on Nantucket at one time, but they've since been extirpated. But over on the Cape, for instance, uh, this dune swale habitat is very important for the, for the uh, spadefoot toad. So if you move out into the beach, uh, onto the flat areas of the beach, you can find some sea beach knotweed. That's a species I'd never seen before coming to Nantucket. It lives on the flat surfaces of the beach and it likes sort of moderate disturbance. It likes having the disturbance of the 
of just natural disturbance like uh, winds and waves and um, some storms. It grows really well in the open. It doesn't do lots of foot traffic or driving. So it's um, actually a rare species in Massachusetts and we actually document it whenever we find it and map it on our properties. The American beach grass in the upper right on the slide uh, is actually a very common species and it's actually extremely important for the dunes. It helps build structure of the dunes and it holds sand together. The roots are very deep, they go down several feet and in their network. And they're just really important in stabilizing and erosion uh, control mitigation. You might notice in the middle of the picture, there's something really tiny that you can't see very well. Well, that's, uh, that's because uh, the birds, the shorebirds that we have, really love to nest in the vegetation along our beaches. So if you're out and about, um, it's almost past nesting season. The birds are fledging and getting ready to, to become adult birds. But, um, always keep an eye out whenever you're out there. They're extremely hard to see. I'm not even sure if you guys are able to see it on your screen, but right at the center, there's still uh, their baby turn. I'm not the uh, ornithologist. On the bottom, we have a native species on the right and a non-native invasive species of some sort on the left. Everybody always thinks that the salt spray rose is a native species of rose, uh, but it was actually introduced from Asia very early in our history. So 1600s, 1700s, the uh, ships coming would actually carry the rose hips, which fruit, they're sort of a tomato shaped fruit, and they would carry them in their holds for vitamin C. So they became established all over our shores, uh, even before the United States was a country. And they can be invasive. Some states consider them invasive. And here they can become a bit of a problem in the dune, but they also hold the dune together. On the right, we have the beach plum, which is kind of the star of, of our dunes as a shrub species. This uh, beach plum produces really uh, edible plums that people use to make beach plum jelly in the fall. And right now the, the plums are small and green and you can probably uh, identify them that way because it, it looks just like a tiny plum that's just green. So also important at Yield Point are the salt marsh habitat areas. And these are populated by Spartina grasses, uh, Spartina patens and Spartina alter alterniflora. Sorry, I can't talk too much today. Um, we also see a lot of species sort of scattered throughout the salt marsh and sea lavender is actually quite abundant here. That's the purple flower on the right. So the sea lavender um, was actually harvested, uh, over harvested in the past because it's so beautiful for um, bouquets and actually transported it on trains into cities for people to use for, for florists uh, arrangements. So we're very lucky that we have so much in our salt marshes. The vegetation marsh is really important in keeping the system cohesive and creating habitat for all the wildlife that lives in a salt marsh and in the creeks. And uh, that habitat is so important for horseshoe crabs and for our, our nesting shorebirds and for a lot of other birds that are just passing through. Um, without that habitat provided, we wouldn't have the nice still air and um, open beaches for them to feed. So moving a, a little bit um, farther south and east uh, is the Head of the Plains property. And this is a view along the road looking north at Head of the Plains. And you would access this property from either Barrett Farm Road or from um, Red Barn Road, which is where Tristram's Landing is. And driving along on the road, you see these big expanses of grassland and coastal heathland, which are both really globally rare early successional habitats. They're dominated by a lot of grasses and forbs, and I wanted to share some pictures of some species. And as I was mentioning to Amy earlier um, off camera, a lot of these species bloom at different times of the year. So these are not all things you would see going out there now. And that's kind of the beauty of doing a Zoom talk is that you can just fly through the air and go to all these properties in, at one presentation. And also you can sort of fly through the seasons. So we have a, uh, a few spring blooming species here. The trailing arbutus is one of the earliest species to bloom. And it's actually a woody trailing vine. So this species is the state flower of Massachusetts and it's also called uh, mayflower. 
and I think probably the association with the Mayflower coming to Massachusetts uh, and starting our, the colony. So other spring species would be the sampling blue-eyed grass, which is the blue flower. This is actually in the iris family. It's not a grass at all. And there are many other species of um, blue-eyed grass, but the sampling blue-eyed grass is sort of unique in that it really likes dry, sandy soil. So we have a lot of it on Nantucket, but it's very rare elsewhere. And it's actually considered a species of special concern in Massachusetts. So they're tracking it to make sure it doesn't become too rare. Here, it's quite abundant. We also have another spring flower, uh, the bushy rock rose, which is the yellow flower in the lower right. And the bushy rock rose is recently uh, something that was removed from the list because of DNA evidence indicating it might be part of another species. So um, regardless of what, which species name you give it, uh, it's actually quite abundant here. And we have a few other species of bushy rock rose too and they're quite showy. They bloom for a very short time, each flower, and then they produce a new flower the next day or a couple of days later. In the upper left, um, there's a species that's actually blooming now, um, the golden sickle leaf aster. And this species is actually globally rare, although it's not really state listed in any of the New England states. And it really thrives on uh, sandy disturbed soil. So almost beach-like conditions um, through the head of the plains, you'll see this growing along the road edges and any other places like that. So it's basically like a little um, yellow daisy flower and each of the leaves is very curved and narrow, which gives its, um, its uh, Latin name, which is Pityopsis falcata for the falcate or curved leaves. So continuing our seasonal mashup, we have a fall plant, the New England Blazing Star. So that's something that you still have to look forward to later in the season. Hopefully we get some rain so that some of these flowers can do better. Um, but the New England Blazing Star usually begins blooming in August and into September. And this is another species that's very uncommon in the rest of New England and the Northeast, but is quite common in certain parts of Nantucket. It really likes the open sandy areas, a little bit less um, disturbed than the uh, yellow sickle leaf thistle, or the yellow sickle leaf aster. So also here we have two milkweeds on the bottom. We've got the orange milkweed, which a lot of people call butterfly weed, not to be confused with butterfly bush, which is a whole different plant and it's not native. So this orange milkweed is native and it's blooming now. If you were to head out to Head of the Plains, you would see a plant beside the road. I think I've, I've named that one Frank because I see that plant every year when it, when it blooms profusely. I'm always like, go oh, Frank, make some seeds. Uh, this plant is pretty rare on Nantucket, even though it's not uh, listed, uh, state listed. It's, um, it's one of those plants that they watch out for because it's very delicious for deer. Uh, they really will eat it and then it can't produce seed. So I'm always rooting for them to flower and to get pollinated and then actually to produce seed because the pollination process is actually really complicated for milkweeds too. Um, they have to be cross pollinating between different plants. One plant can't have flowers from one side pollinating flowers from the other side. It has to be two separate plants at least. And then the pollination of milkweeds is also difficult where I think um, the pollinators legs have to actually go down inside part of the flower to get the pollinia stuck to their legs to carry them to the next plant and then they need to stick their leg in the next flower. So it's not easy and um, we're rooting for them. Go Frank. And on the right, we've got the blunt leaf milkweed, which you saw me sniffing through my bandana earlier and they really do smell that good. You should sniff it whether you're wearing a mask or not. Um, there are just about past bloom. But like the orange milkweed, they're quite rare on Nantucket, and we're really hoping to see that they, um, they set some pods because it's always um, really good for us to actually collect some seed and um, give it back to certain places where there aren't any plants. And also we grow plants in our greenhouse uh, for any areas that need to have be re restored or revegetated. And also for uh, a native plant garden that we're building at our office. On the top right is a plant that's very common on Nantucket, the yellow thistle. And this is a species of thistle that has extremely spiny, spiny bracts around the flower. You can see sort of a crown of spiny bracts around the base of the flower. 
And the flowers are yellow and they often have maroon coloration in them. This is a species I'd never seen before I moved to Nantucket, even though I spent summer vacations on the Cape for a very long time. Every year, um, I had never seen one and they're very common here. They're really important for goldfinches and uh, all the thistles are very popular with pollinators. Speaking of pollinators, uh, we've recently learned in a partnership with this um, Xeric Grassland Barren and Woodland Pollinator Conservation Project, where they're doing surveys of pollinators in grasslands all around New England, that our pollinators are really amazing. So at Head of the Plains, and I believe uh, at Linda Loring, um, the two Nantucket sites, they have some of the highest levels of pollinator diversity on the, in this whole study, so in the whole region so far. So we go out, we place um, bee bowls along transects, and the transect is a long line, and you, you space the bee bowls, which are a cup filled with liquid along them, to catch bees. And we also do netting. You can see my colleague, Danielle, here um, doing some netting of bees, because some bees won't go in a cup. I don't know, they think it's a bad idea. Maybe they are right, because what happens is we take them as samples. So we send them off to an expert for identification. And this picture just sort of gives you an idea of the high diversity of different species of bees. People are really concerned about honeybees, but there are actually a huge number of native bee species. And um, we're really fortunate to still have a high diversity. On the right hand side, the ones with the extremely tiny labels, um, those are head of the plains um, samples. And then on the left side, it's uh, smooth hummocks, which is a land bank property. You can really get a good idea of all the different types of pollinators. Uh, There's so many different, different kinds. And they're becoming more, uh, more and more rare uh, throughout their ranges as habitat is destroyed. So um, Mariah Mitchell is a repository for these collections. And uh, we're really hoping to learn more about that and help, that, help to inform our management so that we're always trying to learn to adapt to uh, manage for groups of uh, wildlife and insects that are really, um, really struggling. So also really key here, uh, head of the plains and other salmon plain grassland coastal heathland properties is uh, Lepidoptera diversity. So butterflies and moths. And uh, everybody's concerned about the monarch butterfly and rightfully so, but there are a lot of species of rare uh, Lepidoptera that call into it home. And I don't have a lot of pictures of those really rare ones, um, but these are some that we commonly see out on our properties. The monarchs are just becoming active and really fly, flying around and, and nectaring and uh, laying eggs on the milkweeds. Uh, in the upper right, the chain dot geometer, which is an inchworm uh, caterpillar. This is a species of special concern in Massachusetts. And it's, it's probably the most cheerful coloration for a, a tiny little uh, inchworm that you can imagine. I just think they, they're the most happy inchworms around. There are thousands of them and they're all feeding on shrubs and, and woody vegetation out at Head of the Plains right now. So you'll definitely see some if you spend some time out there. They're really important in the dynamics of, of the shrublands. Bottom right, uh, Barron's buck moth caterpillars. And these are some really, really young ones. And that's another species, I believe, of special concern in Massachusetts. So it's also fairly rare in the state. Love scrub oak. And in the lower left, a skipper butterfly that I have not identified. Um, we have a high diversity of really small uh, butterflies. So if that's something that someone were interested in as a research project, we would really welcome having a visiting researcher or someone who wanted to be an expert and working on that group. But working on um, preserving habitat at Head of the Plains for these species is really key for us. Heading eastward into the Middle Moors, um, this area is a much shrubbier environment you can see it's in the middle of the island, so it's farther away from the salt spray and the wind. And there are really large tracts. We're very fortunate that the land bank as well as NCF have conserved very large tracts in this area. So you can really kind of, you can actually get really lost there, but in a good way. This is a good image of the Middle Moors and an area that people refer to as the Serengeti. If you're driving along Milestone Road, you'll see why it's called the Serengeti locally. 
So it looks like it opens Savannah with some trees sort of sticking up in different places. And mainly the trees are actually sassafras trees. And um, they're sort of remnants uh, left behind from cutting. The whole shrubland that you see here has been mown annually uh, in the dormant season since about 1998. So the process um, has been ongoing for management there um, in order to um, protect harriers, uh, northern harrier hawks. And it has really changed the habitat. So we have these standing trees that are kind of isolated and then we have low shrubland around them. So it's quite unusual. Throughout the shrublands uh, in the middle moors and especially along the road edges, you start to see a lot of herbaceous species. We started doing some firebreak mowing, which is additional work in, in the moors to prevent wildfire from spreading too rapidly if we were to have a wildfire out there. And one of the unexpected bonuses of all that mowing is seeing a lot more herbaceous species. The pasture thistle, which is one of our native thistles and I think one of the most beautiful. We have wood lilies throughout this area. They like a shrubby habitat, but not too tall and overgrown. They can't tolerate being shaded out for too much. And then we have a lot of white top toothed aster. This is a species of aster that's actually blooming now. It's one of the earliest asters and it's super abundant here on Nantucket, but very rare elsewhere in New England. In the bottom right, uh, yellow wild indigo. This plant is kind of the big puffy ball of flowers. And uh, unfortunately this year, the drought has sort of um, I don't know, given it a bad hair day. It's not looking as great as I hoped when it rained all of June and part of May. Um, but if you get out along the moors, I'm sure you'll find some great plants blooming now of the yellow wild indigo. And these all have uh, different pollinator associations. And then also importantly, uh, different insects that are actually feeding on leaves and um, gall insects. So there's a lot of diversity here. Um, we just use the Lepidoptera and the bees sort of as indicator species in one sense, and also just to learn about the, um, the diversity. It's, um, it's great to have experts that can come out to the island and work with us in their key groups. And in the past several years, um, the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative, which is a sort of a conglomeration of all the environmental groups on the island, has had uh, Charlie Eisman and Julia Blythe um, come out and they've been studying um, the gall, uh, galls and leaf miners and other un understudied insects of Nantucket. So there are a lot of really interesting facets to all these plants uh, and things that we don't even know, newly, a newly described species. So very exciting. You can't forget about the berries. Uh, everybody's got to eat some fruit out there. Uh, I really have been picking huckleberries and blueberries lately. Um, huckleberries are very similar to low bush blueberries. They're a little bit more um, drought tolerant and a bit more shade tolerant. Um, and they have larger seeds in them, so they taste delicious, but however, they do have a bit of a crunch to them. And also, um, we're getting a lot of uh, dewberry this year. We have bristly dewberry, and we also have another species um, called Rubus flagellaris, which is whip dewberry, um, like flagellate, because it will whip you. And it has thorns. So um, delicious berries, thorns, trip you up. Also, um, you'll find thickets of beaked hazelnut. The beaked hazelnut is one of my favorites. It's really an unusual fruit. You see the two, it almost looks like a bird's head with a beak and that's where it gets its name. And each one of those heads um, of the bird actually contains a hazelnut. And this is very similar to um, the filbert or hazelnut that's marketed, um, you know, you can buy it in the store. Um, but this is our native, one of our Native American species of um, hazelnut. The bottom right hand, you know, low bush blueberry, does it need an introduction? Apparently it does, because some people don't know that it's an edible, edible berry. These are kind of finishing up, um, I think, because it's been so dry. So you might, you might have to grab a few last blueberries before they're gone. So you can't talk about uh, the Middle Morris shrubland without talking about scrub oak. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of acres of scrub oak shrubland in the Middle Moors. And it turns out that, you know, that's a really great thing, even though we curse 
the scrub oak trying to walk through it, or if you're a property owner, I'm sure you curse it growing in all of your yard. But it actually supports a really wide variety of rare Lepidoptera, including this Baron's Buck Moth down in the right-hand corner. And we must have the highest density of Eastern Tohi birds anywhere, anywhere. I, I, I defy you to find a place with more Eastern Tohis anywhere in North America. I think we probably have the highest density. So uh, elsewhere in New England, Eastern Tohis are quite rare. Um, shrublands have disappeared and it's either gone into forest or it's been developed. I had only seen one Tohi before moving to Nantucket and now I'm serenaded constantly with drink your tea, drink your tea. And I think you probably have met one of these before too, probably every day if you lived on Nantucket for any length of time. So um, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the sweet fern. It's not a fern. It does smell really sweet. It's related to bayberry. And this is a really cool aromatherapy kind of plant. Uh, if you find it, um, you'll probably know it by its fern-like appearance and its woody stems. Um, but if you don't, you can always scratch and sniff. This is a plant that I grew up uh, enjoying when I was in New Hampshire. So one of the really cool things about the Middle Moors is, you know, vast expanses of scrub oak shrubland, all these low shrublands from where we've maintained with mowing and fire. And then there are these little hidden pockets that are actually kettle hole ponds and bogs. And these were formed during the glaciation and you can learn a lot more about kettle hole bogs than I could ever give in a presentation. But basically they're a depression that was created um, with a chunk of ice that weighed down on the land. And when it melted, it left behind this depression. And typically they're filled with sphagnum moss and then they become colonized with these really cool plants. And some of them are, are start out as ponds uh, and stay ponds for a longer period of time, but some of them progress quickly into being uh, a bog with layers and layers of sphagnum moss. So on the left-hand side, you can see um, the sundews at the top and the pitcher plants at the bottom. These are species that really require a bog habitat. And on Nantucket, they're in sort of hidden hollows and hard to find places that people secretly talk about and might show you someday. Um, the sundews are quite common and the pitcher plants are more rare. They're both carnivorous plants. So uh, the pitcher plant actually has a cavity in the center and it's filled with liquid and insects will be attracted and fall down into the pitcher. And the sundew is almost more interesting in a way because it's covered with these hairs that have a sticky gland and there's a, a, a goo at the tip of each of these, um, these hairs. So an insect lands on the goo and gets trapped. And then the leaf actually kind of folds up a little bit and the insect will sort of um, decompose and liquefy on the leaf and it gets absorbed into the leaf. And these have really lovely flowers, but it's always very difficult to get good pictures of the flowers. So I don't have a great picture. On the right, we have a couple of the inhabitants of the ponds. So if you go out in the moors, um, this is a typical combo that you might see, pickerel weed, which is the purple flower on the top, and fragrant water lily, which is the best water lily because it smells amazing. And um, there are ponds where there are thousands of fragrant water lilies, and it's, it's really something to see. So both of these need deeper water and um, they're quite common if you can find one of the kettle hole ponds. Speaking of ponds, heading back, because we're zooming, we can go wherever we want. We can head back to, toward the western end of the island. Uh, I wanted to show you guys uh, some of the coastal plain pond shore plants at Hummock Pond and Clark's Cove. So you would be accessing um, these through either head of the plains or from Sanford Farm Ram Pasture, and then going along the pond shore to get a good look. So these are areas that have really mesic or wet, rich soil, and they're in the coastal plain valleys um, where the ponds are. So there's a sort of a collecting influence of um, nutrients and, and moisture. So coastal Joe pie weed is just starting to bloom now. So if you were to go out within the next week or two, you'll see it blooming in profusion out at uh, Sanford Farm and along the shores of Hummock Pond. Bone set is a another plant that's um, pretty common in these pond shores and it's got white flowers. 
So coastal Joe pie weed is really tall usually and bone set is much smaller, but they're both um, related. They're in, uh, they were in the same genus and now they're just closely related in the same family. At the bottom, we have a spring wildflower, uh, which usually blooms end of May and into June, the blue flag iris. And we have two species here, and we have the common blue flag iris, which is common throughout New England. And we also have a slender uh, blue flag iris, um, which basically looks the same, except it's much smaller and it's very slender and delicate. So the slender blue flag iris really loves the coastal areas. And it's one of those species that is very common on Nantucket in certain areas, but it's very rare in the rest of New England. So we're very fortunate to have it by the thousands. Um, and if you look for it in June, um, ram pasture is, is a great place, the barn field, and also windswept. In the bottom right, we have a swamp rose mallow, which is getting close to blooming time. It should be blooming August and into September. And the swamp rose mallow is actually our native hibiscus. And this species is non-woody, so it's an herbaceous plant that grows three to four feet tall in one season, and then it dies back all the way to the ground. And it produces flowers that are basically the size of your face, uh, which is a pretty big flower. And it looks very tropical because um, it's related to all the hibiscus that you see um, either as indoor plants or in tropical lands. So um, pretty amazing for a plant to do that up north here and be so vigorous, but you can find uh, large fields of uh, swamp rose mallow, either like at Maya Comet Pond, uh, there's some at Hummock Pond and Kapam Pond, and it, it's, it just does wonderfully here. Along these coastal plain pond shores, we have an interesting sort of bathtub ring effect that happens. So in the, in the summer when it gets dry, the pond level just, just goes down and down and down as, it, as the water evaporates. And if we're not getting a lot more rain to fill it back up again, it just keeps going down. So uh, in some years we have an amazing bathtub ring and it's a little gross because of the geese and the ducks and stuff. But if you get down in there, there's some really interesting plants. And I did do some pond surveying on a year that had really low water. And you find a lot of rare species and things that you never even noticed. Uh, the salt pond stars, the plant in the upper right, that's a, a cluster of plants that would fit you know, in the palm of your hand. And I had brought it in to take a look at it under the microscope and get a good look at it. And that's a species you would never even notice. It just looks like almost like a grass or a seaweed along the pond shore when it's underwater. And then when it comes out of the water, uh, you get to actually see it bloom. And it has really showy little flowers, but you really have to look for it. Um, that might be something that you could see now if the pond level is low enough. And in the bottom right, uh, coastal barnyard grass. And this is a species that just capitalizes on the disturbance of that, of that bathtub ring around the pond. So a disturbed area and you know, intermittently flooded and, and then dried up and it seeds in and grows new plants in different areas. And we were lucky to find some because it's something that's not quite, not very common, but it's very tall, um, three or four feet tall when it's doing really well and quite showy. So we do have a lot of problems with invasives in ponds and wetlands around the island. And these are three of the, I don't know, least wanted, I guess is what people usually say. Um, one of the most problematic species is the common reed at the upper right hand corner in this slide. And you can see um, with one of our field assistants standing next to it that it can get pretty tall, but that's not even how tall it can get. It can get 12 feet tall and she's probably five, five feet three or five four. So um, it can really crowd out the whole shoreline and nothing else can grow. So all of those plant species that I showed you before really would struggle to survive. And we've done a lot of management in different areas of pond shore, but the problem is large. There are a lot of areas of, this, um, of the common reed. So we're choosing our battles. Another real problem is the Japanese or hybrid knotweed. And this is something that people have in wetlands in their yards and they're concerned about. And it's also something that can be a real problem around pond shores. And it's, it's a plant that has bamboo-like stems and heart-shaped leaves. And it can also get to be about 10 or 12 feet tall. 
So very thick growth and it can really take over an area and very, very quickly crowd out what's, what's really special in that area. And when you get a big area of Phragmites or a big area of the common reed or a big area of the, um, the knotweed, it's just very low diversity and it supports a lot less insects and wildlife. On the left-hand side, purple loosestrife. Um, this is a species that's a really serious, invasive, and very widespread off-island. Um, we're fortunate that it's not really dominant here in our wetlands. I'm not really sure why, um, but we do have some problem sites and we try to manage it as we can. And certainly when it pops up in new places to keep it from becoming established. But we really all have limited resources, all the different conservation groups and um, it's, it's challenging to, to do uh, management and to really keep these plants from taking over. Oops, sorry about that. We can't forget Squam Swamp and Squam Farm. Um, heading back to the eastern end of the island, um, this is really our area of mesic forest. And you can see the background behind me is actually part of Squam, Squam Farm. Heading into Squam Farm and Squam Swamp, you see that there are a lot of shrubs. Uh, this area has a huge growth of understory shrubs and it's really interesting. We have a lot of swamp azalea and a lot of sweet pepper bush, more than I've really seen anywhere else except right around a pond shore, which is interesting. Uh, these are shade tolerant shrubs that really like a lot of moisture. Although you can grow the sweet pepper bush in your yard, it's actually a great plant if you're doing some landscaping and you wanna include a butterfly plant that's native, or if you want something that's just um, smells wonderful. So these shrubs are throughout the understory and also along with them, blue dangle huckleberry, uh, that's the one in the lower right with that unusual shade of blue flower. So it's a huckleberry like black huckleberry, but the, the fruit are actually sort of a corn flower blue color. And they're edible um, much like um, black huckleberry or blueberry and they should be ripening in the next uh, few weeks. The blue dangle is the, is the main huckleberry species that you'll find uh, at Squam Swamp and Squam Farm. So much more rare is the flowering dogwood, uh, which is in the lower left here. And it's a beautiful plant, but unfortunately the dogwoods have been suffering from anthracnose um, and the fungus that destroys the flowers. So we're fortunate that we have rare um, patches of this through the forest. And maybe because it's so spread out, um, the fungus doesn't develop at really high levels. And in some years it flowers really vigorously. This year was actually a great year. Uh, I believe it was May that it was flowering. It's actually almost the size of an apple tree um, and just beautiful understory uh, small tree. Speaking of trees, um, Squam Forest trees, we have uh, on the left two below. And Tupelo uh, is a, a really interesting species here. It's the, the most common tree uh, that we found when we did a, a survey of forest species in, in uh, Squam Farm and Squam Swamp. So you can see on the bottom, um, on the left, there's a picture of the Tupelo fruit. So there are these purplish blue colored fruit with a red pedicel. And the, um, the fruit really are very attracted to birds and the birds will be um, spreading the seeds around. And then they also spread clonally into large stands, kind of like what's behind me in my background. So they're very dominant at Squam and um, pretty much you can't throw a stick or a rock and not hit a Tupelo. On the right, we've got a picture of red maple and red maple is really normally a generalist species found throughout the forest. But on Nantucket, it's really more of a wetland specialist. So, what you're really seeing uh, when you're seeing red maple is usually a swamp. And uh, they're really amazing trees. Uh, the spring flowering of the red maple is one of the earliest sources of nectar and pollen for the bees. And it's really pretty amazing. Um, both of these species are actually great for bees early in the season. So starting in uh, between February and April for the red maple and then a bit later for, for Tupelo. People don't really think about um, trees as pollinator plants, but they are. You can't talk about trees and Squam Forest without talking about these trees. Uh, these are some really cool older trees. Uh, most of them are a basal diameter around a meter. 
So they're pretty good sized. And it's kind of funny, the black oak on the left-hand corner, those are uh, fellow um, field researchers and they're sitting in the tree, but the bottom person is actually only a few feet off the ground. Uh, the trees are very large in diameter for their height um, and they branch out very low. So they're quite climbable. And uh, it's in response to the wind and salt spray here that these trees grow in, in such strange ways. Um, but they're quite compelling and very interesting to look at. Uh, you can see the white oak in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner. And this is almost a prostrate uh, growing white oak that's actually split into two um, and just keeps getting lower and lower to the ground. And again, it's a tree that's about a meter at the base and it's actually goes out, it's actually wider, far wider than it is tall. And that's something that it's a response to the, to the extreme winds as our forests began to regrow after deforestation. They, um, they were really impacted and they had to, had to uh, stay low to survive and branch out to get as much sunlight as possible. In the bottom right, um, mockernut hickory. Um, this is not a species of tree that you'll find that's really large here but it is kind of scattered throughout the forest. And it's a really interesting species. It has a hickory nut, um, but it's an unusually small nut uh, for the husk. So we say it's mocking you. you. You think you're gonna get a nice big nut and it's just a little tiny nut. Um, the mocker nut, you can find there's an open field at Squam Farm and you can walk through that and um, up towards the uh, farmhouse. And you'll actually see some mocker nut hickories are good examples of them. Another cool thing about Squam is that there's a lot of interspersion of open uplands and old fields. And you can also find a lot of forest edge species. So walking through in the spring, these are some things that you might see. Um, the arrow leaf violet is in more dry uplands and um, the wild strawberry can go either way, it likes a little bit moist, but it also can be in really dry habitats. And um, the fruit, I'm sorry to say, are just passed, uh, so you're not going to get any strawberries. But next May, early June, um, that's the time to look for wild strawberries. Canada Mayflower, also a May, uh, June species, and windflower. And those are the two, two of the earliest uh, wildflowers. And they'll start to come out very early in the spring. And then as the canopy of the trees comes over them, they tend to just fade out. And um, they really capitalize on that early time in the season without much tree cover. We had some more field and forest edge species, the St. Andrew's cross, the yellow flower in the upper left. This is a, a state endangered species and of all of New England, it only grows on Nantucket and it only grows on the Eastern part of the island. So the Squam Pulpus area. It's actually a tiny shrub that grows really short and um, clonally, so it spreads in patches. And we actually have quite a lot of it. So considering that it's a state endangered species, it's pretty common in certain parts of Nantucket. The purple fa false foxglove is something that'll be coming up blooming uh, in August. And it likes the wetter areas in the open, open grassy wet areas. You'll find it at Windswept as well as at Squam. On the bottom, um, Turk's cap lily. This is kind of the unicorn of Nantucket for lilies. Uh, there are a few sometimes. Uh, it's hard to explain, but some years there'll be a plant in one spot, but you'll come back repeatedly and you won't find it again in that particular spot, which is strange because it grows from a corm and it's something that's a considered a perennial. So um, I think maybe what happens is that it, it doesn't successfully flower because it gets eaten by deer and it waits a few years and and it um, only has vegetation and then it will send up a flower stalk in another year, but I really don't know. So it's something that's kind of a mystery. If anybody's out and about and they see um, one of these lilies, they look a lot like a tiger lily, but they don't have the little black um, berries in the axils of the leaves. So that's one of the ways you can identify them. And unlike the wood lily, the flowers are always pendant. So it's a big candelabra of flowers uh, many, many flowers and instead of just a couple, like for the wood lily. And they'll be dangling downward. We unfortunately have a lot of invasive plants in the, in the forest and field areas at Squam. And um, I think you're probably familiar with some of these, maybe just from sight if you've been here for a while. Um, the bittersweet, um, the orange and um, orange and light orange or orange and yellow flower, um, fruit. 
Um, these will be ripening in the fall and unfortunately they're spread around by the birds. So whenever there's an infestation, it spreads everywhere. And unfortunately the birds don't really get the nutritional value from it that they would from native species. So while it's attractive to them, it's not really the best food. It's more like junk food. And on the left, um, the porcelain berry, this is also um, a berry that's very attractive to the birds and spreads readily. Um, and the fruit come in all different colors. Uh, you'll see all different colors at one time on, on a plant. It's related to grape, so it can really grow fast and, and smother other species. On the bottom left, uh, privet. I know everybody has their privet hedges and um, they're beloved of many people on Nantucket although I think they smell terrible. Some people think they smell wonderful. But um, what can't be argued is that they are spreading in the natural areas. And this is another species that produces a fruit that the birds are always dropping in different spots. So um, if you do have privet, uh, I, de I definitely recommend um, cutting the flowers so that you don't produce fruit because every time the fruit is produced, it gets spread into natural areas and it starts new seedlings. And these tend to crowd out the shrub species that I was showing you earlier. Bottom right hand, um, garlic mustard. This is a biennial herb, uh, herbaceous plant. And we spend a lot of time um, pulling this in the spring because it's something that would take over uh, understory of a forest and really crowd out all the native wildflower species. It has a really pungent garlic odor, so it's easy to identify. So um, heading to the North Shore, um, to Kotu, um, I think take a little bit of a stroll around here since we can zoom anywhere. It's a lot easier to get here on Zoom. Uh, it's a long ride out there or a boat trip. And the dunes, beach, and, and marsh and forest out there are really unusual. So one of the most unusual things is the prickly pear cactus. Uh, we can see in these pictures um, is actually out at Kotu and there are hundreds if not thousands of these plants. Uh, so in flower, it's got a beautiful yellow flower with a reddish center. And then in fruit, it's got these prickly pears. And this is actually a native species for Nantucket. This is the northernmost point in, in New England where it's native. And it's, it's well established all over Kotu. Uh, people have told me that they thought they were hallucinating. They couldn't believe they saw it out there. And what happened? Uh, how did it get out there? But it's actually been there all along and um, well before the colonists arrived. So uh, some other species of Kotu. Um, the red cedar juniper is putting on quite a show right now. The fruit are all ripening in this bright blue color. And we also have um, bearberry that's ripening in the bottom left. Uh, bearberry is a relative of um, cranberry. So it looks very similar. And this you can find in the heaths out in the moors or out on Kotu or at head of the plains. On the right, um, kind of an unusual thing, our lady slippers um, growing out at, at um, Kotu actually like to live out in the bearberry. And there's these huge bearberry barrens with lots of, of uh, lady slippers which is very strange. That's not a normal habitat for a lady slipper. They usually like a pine forest or something like that. And because it's so windy out there, the um, lady slippers sometimes are only a few inches tall um, because they just can't afford to be whipped around in the wind at a taller height. Uh, so it's, it's kind of cute. Some other surprises out there, um, the blunt-leaved um, grove sandwort, which is a big mouthful. Uh, this is a really tiny white flower that's actually really uncommon on Nantucket, but it's super abundant in the spring out on Kotu. And also Herb Robert on the right-hand side, this little pink flower. This is one of the geraniums, our native geraniums. And um, this plant is only found out on Kotu. And on the mainland, it's found in forest. So it's kind of an unusual, where did, where did this come from? Why is this here? Uh, relict of the past. And it really likes those um, cedar woodlands. So um, that pretty much wraps up my talk of zooming around the island with botany. Um, I just wanted to mention that people can learn more about these properties by going to the Nantucket Conservation website. And you can also download the free Act Trails app on your smartphone, uh, which is easy to use. And we're always building on that. Um, get out there and get a chance to do some botany. 
And just finally, to thank all the people that have been on our staff that have provided photos over the years and our year round staff and our, our field assistants. And there was a few, there were a few photos in here that were from other contributors and it was noted on the slides. But um, it's great to get out and observe and hopefully we have some questions and uh, Amy, Janet. Yeah, if anybody has questions, please write them in the Q&A, <clears throat> which you'll find the icon at the bottom of your screen, and just type them there, and uh, and we'd be happy to answer them. Actually, Kelly would be happy to answer them. <laughs> I actually, while we're waiting, I actually have a question. You pointed out in code two the juniper berries. Mm -hmm. um, are there something you could eat or because I know that's what gin I like a cocktail uh, that's what gin is flavored with is that a similar juniper berry or is it something else uh, it, it does have uses that um that include culinary uses and um you have to be really careful with native plants to to really look up all, all the issues and make sure you have the id right so we always caution people to get the id correct yeah a lot of this, um, the red cedar juniper here, and it is pretty easy to identify. Um, I've heard of people using it as a seasoning. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's really successful in making gin. It's other species that have been traditionally yeah. used for gin, but I think it could probably pinch hit. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so here's a question from Mary. What rules should we be following on conservation land as far as taking materials? such as berries, limbs, plant seeds. Um, I would assume we shouldn't take anything, but I'm not sure what the rules are. So that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, now I sound like Darth Vader. Um, maybe that was just a plan. Uh, so really it, it differs between the different organizations and uh, Nantucket Conservation Foundation does not really want people to be removing things for commercial purposes and um, collecting, um, you know, out picking blueberries or beach plums, that's fine as long as it's not for commercial purposes. And it's just really good for people to be cognizant of over harvesting and just taking a bit from here and a bit from there, um, even when you're just picking blueberries, because those are food for the birds and for other organisms. And um, that's a really good question. I could talk more about it at length, but um, different groups have more of a, um, Different, different set of rules. Some, some organizations might not mind harvesting, but it's always good to check with the website of the organization or maybe talk to somebody on the staff if you have specific questions. Great, and um, here's a question that says, do we have wild blackberries on Nantucket or are they bristly dewberry and is it edible? We have several species. Um, Sorian Dunwoody um, described the um, the taxonomy of the blackberries is a thorny issue that they didn't want to get into. And I always think that's really funny. So there's, there are a couple of upright blackberries that are considered native to Nantucket. And then there's the bristly dewberry and the um, whip dewberry, which is the one that will trip you up and take you down and make you wish you didn't have to pick thorns out of your hand for the rest of the day. Um, but yeah, they're all basically a blackberry. Um, they just vary in size. And um, if you get them at, at peak ripeness, they're actually quite tasty. Okay. Um, let's see. So if we wanted to grow local native plants in our own garden, what is the best way to get them? I've gotten plants that are advertised as native, but turn out not to be the same as local species. That's tricky. So um, there's a couple different issues. There's um, getting plants that are native to the region or to Nantucket or plants that are listed as natives, but they're actually native to North America. A lot of garden centers just call everything native that's native to North America. But if you really wanted to approximate uh, a native Nantucket or a native New England habitat, you want to get more specific. Um, we, did we did prepare a um, pamphlet that's actually available online. If you search native plants Nantucket, you'll come up with that pamphlet. And it gives a list of species that are actually native to the island and the best uses for them and characteristics. That was something that was created by the um, Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative and the, the Nantucket Land Council, and I worked on that. And it's very useful. Uh, you can really zoom, get, get right in on what you want. 
You can also go to local nurseries. I know um, particularly uh, Surfing Hydrangea has a lot of natives and you can ask questions. Um, just tell them you really want native plants. The final layer of it is whether it's a, a cultivar or if it's a straight species and then whether it's native um, material genetically. So you could get um, little blue stem grass that could be from Wyoming and it's still the same species, but it's from Wyoming, the genetics are different. Or you could get a uh, little blue stem grass that's bright blue. And that's not really like what we normally have here. So you really kind of have to make that distinction, like do you care in your garden? Um, and also, you know, what are you going for? What are your goals? For us, for a restoration project, we would not want um, grass from Wyoming. We would want something that's from as close to here as possible. And we actually harvest um, the seed for our own use, but not commercially. Okay, um, here's a poison ivy question. How did poison ivy arrive? I'd love to explore the island's floor more, but I'm fearful of getting poison ivy. So poison ivy has probably been here since day one. So when Nantucket was originally connected to the mainland, we pretty much had the full complement of plants that was on the mainland. And then as the sea levels rose and the island became isolated, we were kind of left with, with what we had and also what birds carry back and forth. So birds are the main vector for spreading poison ivy around. It's not that I blame birds. They're great, but they eat and they poop and they'll poop out the, um, the seeds all over the place and it starts new poison ivy plants. Um, the best defense is a good offense with poison ivy, wearing um, boots, tall boots, if you're going into an area where you know there's poison ivy and wearing long sleeves and long pants. So that's what we do, um, socks and shoes, not you know barefoot. Um, and also washing up very carefully when you come home because the oils, once they get on you are, um, really hard to get off. You need to use a good um, dish soap or Technu soap. Um, but uh, we are experts in handling poison ivy contact and um, you really have to be vigilant and not get it on your equipment or like if you get it on your shoes and then you carry your shoes around, you can get it. So I think, um, you know, kind of like with COVID, a lot of washing and, um, you know, being observant where you're going and um, staying safe. Safe distance from poison ivy is best, definitely. Okay, here's a question. How can we provide habitat in our yards to encourage native plants to grow other than not mowing? That's a great, uh, great question too. Um, yeah, I mean, not mowing, you'll often get a field of invasive species because that's what's there. That's what can exploit that habitat. So um, the best thing is if you can get somebody who's a landscaper that's knowledgeable about, about that topic. Um, I've also had people contact me and I come check out their yard and give them some advice. And that's all, also useful to me because I get kind of a window into their yard and what's going on in their part of the island for the flora project. And I found some interesting species that way. Um, so you want to kind of figure out what you've got and you can tell kind of what's going to colonize if you can see what's in the surrounding vegetation that might be uh, seeding in. Um, and then I think um, look at that pamphlet that we have and give you some ideas of things that would be suitable for your site, um, depending on the soil conditions, how wet it is and how sunny it is and um, whether it's really close to the shoreline. And um, then go to, um, go to a, a landscaper or go to a nursery and, and talk to them a bit about what you could do. And I'd say if you're doing a whole yard, start with one area and, and try that first. And then just kind of move around the yard doing different areas, different years. Um, is Queen Anne's lace native? No, um, that's an easy question. Um, it's, it's native to the old world. So it was actually brought here by colonists. And it has an interesting uh, history ethnobotanically. And um, I'm not sure what of that is true, but I was just reading an interesting book that it was actually used for contraception. So it was brought sort of along the way by settlers and women would use it as secret contraception. Uh, so there are a lot of uses of plants and they were brought along as herbs or, you know, something like that. And you think of them today as weeds, but they actually spread from those introductions. And um, yeah, Queen Anne's lace is one of those. It's actually a wild carrot. 
which is where our uh, cultivated carrot came from. Uh, let's see, can you recommend an app that will help you identify a plant from a photo that you take of it? So my coworkers have been joking that I'm the app and you just send me a picture, but if everybody starts sending me random pictures of plants, I'll be very busy all the time, even more so than usual. Um, I've heard that people have used a bunch of different things like iNaturalist and PlantSnap are two that I've heard. Um, when you take a picture, you might wanna get a few different pictures to try in the app because you might get different results. Um, I think I would recommend that people get acquainted with the GoBotany website. You can use that on your phone. Um, GoBotany requires your brain, but you can learn a lot. And I think you can really use the keys that they have there to identify plants pretty easily. There's a simple key and then there's the formal key that botanists use. Uh, I use simple key sometimes for just a quick, oh, hey, maybe it's easy. And then sometimes I have to do the full key. But yeah, go, go to the Go Botany website. It's operated by the Native Plant Trust and it's really excellent. Great photos and pretty good information. Also tells you if it's present on Nantucket um, based on that old information of what's here. Okay, um, so I have a question. I was really struck by how many examples in your talk tonight were um, seem to be doing pretty well in Nantucket, but struggling in other parts of the state or New England. Mm -hmm. And is that because those areas haven't been developed or because they don't have invasive species to the degree that other places do? Do you have a sense of why some of those plants are doing so well here? It, it varies a lot by species. I think a lot of times uh, the habitat is not suitable off island because we have that dry, sandy, weird coastal climate. We're at the northern end of some species ranges, so they don't do well farther north or they just don't have the right soil conditions. But it is true that about 45% of our island is conserved land. So we have a really great resource here and a lot of open land that hasn't been developed. It has been affected by human use, but in some cases, like with the sampling grassland and the coastal heathlands, the human use actually expanded those areas. And we actually have really large areas of sampling grassland and coastal heathland, whereas on the mainland, the, the areas are tiny, teeny, tiny. And um, it's really hard to survive if you're limited to a teeny, tiny area that's fragmented from all the areas. But we have a, an ability for things to to cross pollinate from different properties because they're close enough or there's connectivity, like having the land bank properties that are actually connected to the NCF properties and so on. It actually makes for, uh, for much better uh, wildlife corridors and also for plant corridors. Interesting. And yeah. are there controlled burns happening or, or not? So uh, the land bank uh, does control burns or prescribed burns. Um, we are not. Um, they're extremely expensive and um, challenging with all the houses and um, the built up properties around some of our properties. So NCF has made the decision not to do prescribed fire. We just can't, uh, we can't afford the um, actual act of doing it and the liability insurance is really major. Um, the land bank can operate under um, the town's liability insurance, so it's a bit different for them. And um, fire is great, but we were also noticing that we weren't seeing some of the effects that we really wanted to see in expanding the grasslands and heathlands. So um, we've, we've been working with mowing and some disc harrowing, uh, which disturbs the soil. And those can be good alternatives when you can't do fire. Um, fire does have some really amazing effects though. So it's, it's too bad not to be able to have that uh, as part of the, the toolbox. Yeah. So the land bank is lucky that they can still, still do the prescribed fire. Cool, all right. Um, well, do you have any final thoughts? I don't, there's no more questions. Well, I hope everybody can get out there and enjoy the properties and um, stay safe social distancing. Uh, we've been seeing a lot more use on the property, so um, be really considerate and um, get out and check out those flowers and check them out on Go Botany or try a plant app um, or email me and um, hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Kelly. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me.